The housing extremely serious situation here in Spain has been going on long before March 2020. Here, 36.1% of the population spend more than 40% of their incomes for paying the rent each month. According uh, to the latest public data from 2011, there, in, uh, there are in Spain 3.4 million empty homes in the country, many of them owned by large holders. The public and social housing park is between seven and 10 times smaller than other European developed countries. Meanwhile, more than 60,000 million of euros of public budget, public money, have been sent to the banks and financial institutions um, for the rescue in the, under the 2008 crisis, and nothing has been returned. This is a big shocking information where listen, when listening abroad, but here in Spain it seems that this is a completely acceptable situation. It's strange that it is. The PA and um, La Iniciativa por una Ley que Garantiza el Derecho a la Vivienda, the initiative for a law that guarantees the right of housing, have taken a step forward with the writing of a bill that will be presented to political parties shortly, expected in two weeks from now. They are trying to fight back the paralysis of the negotiations of the housing law in the coalition government. In it, the grassroots proposals, uh, they propose measures uh, to guarantee housing for those who need it, and obviously enough money, enough budget should be provided for public housing policies. Also, they demand legal mechanisms that make those responsible for the real estate crisis and large homeowners to assume uh, social responsibility and avoid new speculative bubbles. Spain is one of the European countries with the worst regulations for both for ownership and also rental housing. And that is one of the main reasons to not provide a truly dignified life for being uh, for a lot of percentage of the population. Sorry for my English. After a COVID-19 pandemic, this, this is even much more evident. And uh, now the privatization and uh, financialization of housing is not an exclusive Spain problem. And our three guests today will be able to tell us this and lots of other things. And let me introduce them. Uh, we have uh, the three uh, special reporters for housing, the current person, which is Bala Krishnan Rajigopal, sorry for my pronunciation. Thanks for joining us from the States. I cannot hear you. Uh, actually, I cannot hear you. Uh, Hello, I will can you hear me oh. now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Hello. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for joining us. And we have two former special reporters, which is Leilani Farah. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hola. Thanks for joining us. You are joining us from Toronto, right? From Canada? No, no from Ottawa, mm. Canada, the capital. Okay, from Ottawa, Canada. And then we have Raquel Rornick uh, from Brazil. Hola, Raquel. Hola. <laughs> she will speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. and, and she's more than happy to, to speak Portuñol, you said, right? Yeah, Portuñol. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she's more than happy to, to speak Portuñol, you said, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, uh, like 90 minutes, but uh, Mr. Barakrishnan has to go in like 30 minutes. So we will, uh, the best thing to do for me is to stop talking and, uh, and start with the questions. We are, we are having several blocks. And the first one uh, I will address to Mr. Balakrishnan right now is, um, I will ask you to summarize your own vision of housing. Uh, is it a human right? Is it the basic need? Um, is it a fundamental good or uh, for a meaningful life? Uh, what is your view on this? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to say that uh, I uh, want to welcome the new effort to introduce the uh, law on the right to housing by PAH and uh, associated social movements and groups. I think that it's a truly democratic effort to induce lawmaking from below, uh, and I hope it succeeds. So my best wishes for that. Uh, in terms of whether it, it is uh, housing is or should be a human right, of course, uh, you can put me in the category of people who strongly believe that uh, housing 
should not be a commodity, but it should be a human right. Uh, in fact, the very idea of enshrining uh, housing as a human right in international law is to uh, take it beyond the everyday sort of uh, needs that dictate uh, profit-making activities, but instead to ensure that certain basic entitlements remain protected, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the conditions of development, no matter what the type of political regimes, no matter what kind of cultures that people are actually living in, nevertheless, everyone in the world is entitled to certain basic things. And among those are, of course, uh, food, water, and housing, and other basic necessities. And so I certainly believe uh, that uh, housing is uh, and should be a human right. Now, how we go about protecting housing as a human right is a, is a more complicated measure. Uh, legal protections are very important. Constitutional protections are, of course, uh, extremely important. Um, but uh, I just want to be very clear that just because we, pro we ensure that uh, housing is protected through law formally does not at all make sure that housing is actually uh -huh. enjoyed in practice. There are far too uh -huh. many ways in which what uh, uh, is put into paper can remain only as a paper tiger. It doesn't actually lead yeah. to any real changes. Uh, we have seen that in too many countries. And uh, I trust that with the energy and the commitment that PAH and others are bringing to the table here, uh, that would not be the case in Spain. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe Leila, Leilani could tell us something about, is it, is, is, is it real that this is a paper uh, that has no value in several countries? I mean, the, the, the right to, to housing? Um, a, a, just a couple of comments. Um, first, just Absolutely. on the issue of whether and, you know, is housing a human right? Well, you know, Raj said it well. I want to underscore that, I mean, of course it's a human right. And Spain has signed and ratified a whole slew of treaties recognizing that right and committing itself to the human right to housing and the legal obligations that flow from that. And of course, housing is a human right because it is so fundamental to human dignity and human dignity is at the core of all human rights as is security and life itself. Uh, so fundamental to the human right pursuit. So I just wanna say that. Um, in terms of uh, what Raj said, I mean, of course laws are never sufficient, but in my opinion, mm -hmm. right to housing law is always necessary. So necessary, but never sufficient. Um, and, and because it's so easy uh, for governments, well, it's not always easy to enact law. It's not always easy to mm -hmm. enact law, but when they do enact law, it is quite easy to ignore that law and um, not move on it. And so mm -hmm. of course there is a continued and ongoing role for PA and uh, community organizations and movements to constantly be pressing governments to do something with the law once they've adopted it. And it's, it's not great that that's the way it goes, but that is often the way it goes. In Canada, for example, we recently adopted very new legislation. It's only two mm -hmm. years old. And in that legislation for the very first time, the national government said that it is the policy of the government to recognize housing as a fundamental human right. And since then for two years, they've been enacting policies and programs, none of which actually engage the idea that housing is a human right. So the work continues, but without that law, our work as advocates is much harder with the law, it's a little bit easier because we can keep pointing to the law and we can say this, there is this law. And if we have to, we can litigate. That's at the end of the road. We hope yeah. not to have to do that, but we can point to the law and we use it to encourage the government to do more and to do better. Mm -hmm. That is what we don't have yet here in Spain. <laughs> okay, Raquel. 
Um, your turn. Hola. Hola a todos. Hola. Un saludo muy, muy especial a Pa, pero también a todos los que luchan en este momento en España contra los desalojos, contra la alza de los alquileres, por un acceso a la vivienda como un elemento central de política pública en nivel local, pero también a todos los niveles gubernamentales en España. Creo que esta, esta lucha es una lucha de España, pero es también en este momento una lucha global, una lucha en todo el planeta, porque España ahora, en este momento, con una iniciativa de discusión de una ley de vivienda que incluye, que, que está basada en el derecho a la vivienda, puede también nos dar, nos fornecer un ejemplo en otras situaciones y otros países que también en este momento están enfrentando problemas de vivienda muy graves, muy, 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 y una situación que yo llamaría de casi una emergencia habitacional, uh -huh. Uh -huh. una situación de crisis habitacional. Yo añadía, añadiría con, el, con lo que Balakrishna y también Leilane han puesto sobre la mesa sobre la idea de vivienda como un derecho humano que lo, la tercera pregunta, que es que el revés, cómo la vivienda, y Leilani ha señalado un poco esta perspectiva, tiene un efecto sobre el conjunto de los derechos humanos. O sea, el derecho a la vivienda es como una especie de portal a partir de lo cual se pueden acceder a otros derechos, el derecho al trabajo, el derecho a la salud, el derecho a la educación, el derecho a un medio ambiente eh, sano, el derecho a la seguridad alimentaria, porque no es solamente una cuestión de tener un techo y cuatro paredes, un techo sobre la cabeza, sino es poder estar en un pedazo de ciudad, en un pedazo de vida urbana, y por lo tanto es muy importante, y esto es lo que quería yo dejar al inicio de nuestra discusión, una iniciativa de ley que no ponga solamente tenemos que tener el derecho a la vivienda a todos, sino una ley como se está, esta que se está cocinando eh, desde abajo, como lo señaló Raja Gobal, con mucho más detalle concreto sobre las cuestiones concretas que tienen que ver con la vivienda, desde el precio de alquiler hasta lo que, cómo y cómo se deben pasar los desalojos, el acceso a la vivienda pública y mucho más, para que sea mucho más una especie de guión de políticas públicas y no solamente una declaración genérica sobre el derecho a la vivienda. Mm -hmm. Okay, so inspiring, Raquel. Thank you very much, and thank you for your nice words to the for the bar and for all the housing movement in in Spain. I think they are listening and they are watching and they are feeling very happy right now. Um, uh, Dr. Rodrigo Pau, uh, can you explain us uh, what is this strange word that I have so many problems to pronounce? The financialization for housing. What is exactly that? It, 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 why does that affect so much to the right of housing? Uh, yes, um, one minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, sorry. Um, so I, I think that the this question, uh, of course, can be uh, answered much more amply by my predecessors the former special rapporteurs on adequate housing, Raquel Rolnik and uh, Leilani Farha, who uh, have done such important work highlighting the uh, question of financialization, which became obvious essentially after the 2008 financial, global financial crisis. Oh. Basically, the, the bottom line is this. In recent years, massive amounts of global capital have been invested in housing as a commodity. 
as security for financial instruments that are traded in global markets and as a means of accumulating wealth. Now, finance was, of course, always part of housing, but it wasn't in part of the instrumentalization of finance traded on global markets, nor was housing targeted by global investors as a particular oh. commodity for the circulating global capital. But that actually became more and more obvious in the circumstances leading up to the 2008 financial, global financial crisis, the effects of which are still with us today. Um, the 2008 crisis was triggered by overconfident investment in mortgage-based based securities. When the financial housing bubble burst, many found themselves homeless overnight. In the United States of America, there was an average of 10,000 foreclosures per day in 2008 as many as 35 million people are affected by evictions over a five-year period. In Spain, more than half a million foreclosures between 2008 and 2012 happened. And in Hungary, uh, so, I'm sorry, in Spain, more than half a million foreclosures between 2008 and 2013 resulted in over 300,000 evictions. There were almost 1 million foreclosures between 2009 and 2012 in Hungary. In the global south, financialization is experienced more differently. Informal settlements in southern cities are regularly, regularly demolished for luxury housing and commercial developments such as shopping malls and other high-end services intended for those with expendable incomes are put up. And here again, you see a connection with the circulation of global capital and global finance. Mm -hmm. Massive evictions continue using state power in the global south, often using eminent domain, masquerading as public actions. But in reality, they are the interests of local and transnational economic actors are the ones that predominate through these evictions. Additionally, bilateral investment treaties signed by many of the countries in the global south have also been found to be unfairly balanced in favor of investors with little or no concern for the human rights impacts of their actions. So uh, on the whole, you can see that there is a range of particular uh, circumstances that have to do with political economy uh, that led to the global financial crisis in 2008, as well as the insertion of particular techniques such as bilateral investment treaties, as well as other instruments that actually come from the international trade regime that actually put pressure on countries to increase the financialization of housing. Okay, Raquel Mailani, who wants to jump in? Well, Raquel wrote the book, so go ahead, Raquel. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, sí, hemos, hemos hecho mucho trabajo, yo eh, primero y después Leilani también muchísimo sobre este tema. Pero para traducirlo de una manera muy simple acá en nuestra conversación, yo diría, cuando hablamos de aparatitos telefónicos como este y los precios de los aparatitos telefónicos, ya todos saben que depende este mucho de la competencia, de cuánta gente quiere comprarlos mm. y cuánta gente han producido los aparatitos y así se puede comprar más por precios mejores o peores. Y es una total falacia imaginar que los precios de los inmuebles residenciales, precios de alquileres o precios para compra-venta de los de los pisos, de las casas, dependen de la oferta y de la demanda. Mm. O sea que es una cuestión de producir más, como muchas iniciativas lo, 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 lo traen y lo dicen, y muchos gobiernos dicen, oh no, basta que posamos apoyar a que promotores hagan más, se produzcan más vivienda, porque así más gente va a tener acceso a vivienda. No es así. ¿Y por qué? Porque la vivienda se ha convertido, y el espacio construido en general, pero la vivienda en particular, se ha convertido en un activo financiero. ¿Qué quiere decir un activo financiero? Quiere decir que la vivienda 
tiene un rol en una lógica de inversión financiera para inversionistas financieros que cada vez más son globalizados porque las finanzas pueden moverse libremente, la gente no, pero las finanzas sí se mueven libremente entre los países y se acumulan en una especie de grande nube que paira en el, sobre el mundo buscando dónde bajar para poder generar más interés y más ganos. Y estamos hablando de un surplus, de un excedente de capital financiero global que está con un hambre increíble para poder tener activos. Y se mete en estos activos, no necesariamente porque lo necesita para utilizarlo ya. Lo necesita para estar on the books. Lo necesita para mejorar el perfil del investidor en el mercado global. Y no necesariamente para utilizarlo. No, esto significa que nosotros, pobres ciudadanos que necesitamos de los espacios, residentes de las ciudades, que necesitamos de los espacios para vivir, para poder sobrevivir, tenemos que competir en el mercado residencial de alquiler o de compra venta con estos actores globales que están ahí no porque lo necesitan y lo van a utilizar, pero que están ahí para utilizarlos como activos. Entonces, lo que hay que hacer en términos de política de vivienda es cortar la conexión con la vivienda como activo financiero y no promover más y más programas en esta dirección. Creo que Leilani puede aportar mucho más ejemplos también y desarrollar esta cuestión, pero creo que es muy importante entender la base de todo esto y entender por qué, a pesar de que hay producción, a pesar de que hay pisos, ¿no? estos no estén accesibles a quienes efectivamente lo necesitan. Leilani, uh -huh. how, how can we get that uh, terrible connection? Well, we first have to make sure that it's well understood what connection there is because it's not as um, talked about, discussed, etc. cetera, in, in the Spanish context, maybe, but globally not. And uh -huh. um, one of the things I wanted to say is that Raquel um, and Raj provided a very good um, um, summary of how of, of, of what's happening. I want to just add one thing. It's not just that housing is being used as a commodity or viewed as a commodity. I actually think it's no longer housing at all. And I know Raquel and Raj will agree that housing for these actors is, is only finance. And finance mm -hmm. itself has become financialized. <laughs> The, the purchasing of all this property and units has zero to do with housing. It is only to leverage more capital, in fact. It is the pursuit of more finance. So, so in that way, housing has completely lost its sense as home, a place for family, et cetera. And the other thing I wanted to add is just to underscore I, I really loved, Raquel, your description of this global capital and the way it, it, it is global and people aren't, you know, and it's swirling around. And it is so much capital. We have to understand, like, if you take one of the largest private equity firms, not Blackstone, everyone thinks I'm going to talk about Blackstone, but mm -hmm. BlackRock. BlackRock yeah. has under its management, and they are engaged in the financialization of housing. BlackRock has under its management trillions of dollars, more than the GDPs of many countries taken together. They have a seat at the political table like no other. They, 
they are running finance. They are running our tax schemes and tax regimes around the world. They are in control. And so it's not just how do we break housing from commodity. It's how do we get governments to step up and take the leadership and take it away from these actors that have completely changed the housing landscape globally, in, including in the global south. We have to, we have to recognize that. If this is not just a northern phenomenon, and Raquel mm -hmm. can talk very much about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's disrupting their power the, I mean, the, this constant, if you look at monetary policy around the world, monetary policy is being dictated by private equity. The establishment of exceptionally low interest rates creates free money for these actors. Free money. It's not mm. just cheap. It's free. It's free. You see, and so, what, so it's not an easy thing. This what we are trying to do here to break all of this. It we have to understand we really are little. We're the little people here, but we have so much power because, as Raquel said, they do rely on renters to give the return to the shareholders. They are using pension fund money, workers, workers' pension funds. There are tenants, millions of tenants and, and people living in informal settlements around the world. Imagine the power we can all have if together collectively and globally, we start challenging these actors. But it's not mm -hmm. gonna be easy. <laughs> It will be not. Um, I will ask, uh, uh, do you still have like five minutes for us, Balakrishnan, to stay with us? Uh, my, my apologies, but I must unfortunately leave. Uh, I'm already late by a few minutes to when I'm supposed to be. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Then, if so... Maybe uh, but what I would just, if you will permit me, I would just say again that uh, yes. I think that um, the importance of what you're trying to do is not only for Spain, but as a role model for many other locations, because the problems that you're dealing with uh, are quite common across many mm -hmm. different parts of the world. The financialization of housing, the impact on renters, the question of evictions, and uh, the expiry of the moratoria that were imposed during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are all common problems. And the attacks on human rights defenders who stand up for housing rights, which we have seen in Spain, which was a subject of a communication from me to the Spanish government uh, recently, uh, they're all quite common. Uh, the rights of those who protect the rights uh, to housing and water and other economic and social rights, they need to be protected proactively. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, I'm also very curious to see how well the Spanish judiciary will adapt if the law becomes uh, fully, you know, on, it becomes, uh, it, it is actually adopted, how well the Spanish judiciary would um, be successful in uh, implementing it. Uh, uh, as we have seen from the experience of other countries, for example, most prominently South Africa, um, countries that have attempted to constitutionalize right to housing have not found it easy to uh -huh. ensure that they are implemented in practice. Uh, much, much remains to be done to transform the conditions that can lead to the actual realization of the right to housing including the culture of the judiciary and the accountability of the judiciary, uh, yeah. which is, I think, terribly important. And I hope that this law, when it goes forward, there's at least some sort of a reporting requirement on the part of the judiciary to submit an assessment of, for example, the extent to which they are successful in implementing cases under this law. Uh, there has to be just more transparency about mm -hmm. the 
conditions, the reasons based on which the judiciary reaches its decisions. Uh, so with that, you know, I hope uh, I wish you all the best and um, I hope to support and uh, remain engaged in the days and months to come. Uh, mm -hmm. Good luck. Okay. Thanks for your question. It's been a honor and I really hope that the Spanish government has been listening to your words, to your wisdom, wisdom words. So um, the best of the lacks with your work, uh, which is very important, the best of the luck for you. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, so we continue. I, I'm changing the blocks because um, uh, since uh, Leilani was talking about the Bluetooth funds, maybe we can talk about the strategies that we can use if you want to, because we, are, we were going to talk about rentals, but you were saying so many interesting things about this. So what the strategies can, can we use in the face of uh, Bluetooth funds that in the case of Spain, for instance, uh, control much of the housing market, despite the general narrative that the market, the market, sorry, is in the hands of the small homeowners. That's why what uh, lots of people tell here in Spain. How can the influence of vulture funds on current governments be limited? Uh, and what legislation can be passed? What is your opinion on the mortgage system in Spain? Um, is it the cruelest of the countries you have knowledge of? So. Any of you? Okay, yeah. Raquel. Um, first of all, it's, it's, it, oh, Spanish. <laughs> yes, I'm understanding <laughs> in English. Ah, yes. Eh, eh, primero, lo que, lo que estos, estos fondos abutre, ¿no? Que, que esos fondos buitre. ¿Qué, es, ¿Qué son uh -huh. estos fondos buitre? Son exactamente estos fondos de inversión, estos actores eh, que manejan grandes sumas, grandes sumas de, de dinero, de capital financiero, y que en una situación de crisis, cuando hay un proceso de devaluación del stock construido, que lo que pasó, por ejemplo, después del estallido de la burbuja, ¿no? que hubo una baja de precios de inmuebles en España también, en Estados Unidos, en Irlanda, otros países, lo adquirieron y eh, ellos, como tienen un, manejan una cantidad estupenda de recursos financieros, pueden eh, comprar en grueso, o sea, comprar miles en una condición especial en el momento de devaluación y tienen la posibilidad incluso de esperar un largo tiempo para reevaluar todo esto. Esto es totalmente distinto de pobres nosotros, ¿no? que no, no tenemos las condiciones de competir en el mercado de compra-venta de estos inmuebles con estos grandes personajes. ¿no? Esto y, esto, y ellos efectivamente entraron a comprar y a poner este stock bajo alquiler, o sea, movilizarlo eh, como un stock de alquiler. Uh -huh. Y eh, como lo que, lo que denominamos en inglés de eh, corporate landlords, de señoríos corporativos. Pero lo que quiero señalar acá porque la cuestión es cómo manejar esto, cómo impedir esto, cómo hacer con que esto no sea no la regla, porque claro, toda la discusión sobre control de alquiler encuentra una, un desafío enorme, que es la idea de que, bueno, nuestra tía, nuestra abuela vive de un pequeño alquiler que tiene, de un pisito que ha comprado, que ha heredado, y en realidad, lo que parece entonces es muy impopular poner trabas ¿no? en alza de alquiler por estas situaciones. Pero en general, y en el mercado en Cataluña, en Barcelona en particular, es muy claro la entrada masiva de esta nueva figura 
de señorío, de propietario, que no es más uno u otro inmueble, pero que si no tiene una, una capacidad de monopolio sobre los precios de alquiler a partir de su posición de acumular muchos inmuebles y decirle que nada de esto sería posible sin la actividad activa política pública. Entonces, este es el punto que yo quería señalar acá. Tenemos hoy políticas públicas en España y otros países del mundo que han sido dibujadas para atraer estos fondos financieros hasta el stock, muy claramente. Entonces, son figuras como las Sareps, como los fondos mm. de inversión inmobiliaria, que son figuras eh, dibujadas exactamente para poder permitir y atraer este tipo de personajes en los mercados residenciales de nuestras ciudades. Entonces, esto es muy, o, o políticas como los Golden Visa, ¿no? la idea de tener mm. una visa si compra inmuebles de un precio tal, tiene, tiene ciudadanía. O sea, son estas políticas que han atraído. Entonces, hay que reformar estas políticas. No es una cuestión de imaginar una política loca, ¿no? sino de rever las políticas que ya están evaluando de qué manera estas políticas están con un efecto perverso de... Eh, disponibilizar este gran estoque a estos tipos de inversionistas financieros. Uh -huh. She's brilliant. She knows of what <laughs> she speaks. Um, so, of course, I completely agree with how Raquel laid that out. Uh, the, the, the feeling I always have is that what after the global financial crisis, what governments did, including the government of Spain, was that they decided to host, to be very good hosts to the mm -hmm. vulture funds, the private equity firms, the pension funds, et cetera. And they provided a buffet. Uh, I don't know if it translates in Spanish, but you know, like a big table full of food, but the Buffet, food is as that's the same yeah, one. Buffet yeah. libre. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what Raquel was talking about. This public policy buffet. And it's mm -hmm. tax advantages and providing assets here. Take our social housing. Yes, buy our social housing. Um, and and take take away the public and make it private. That was on the buffet. And so what needs to happen is Spain needs to be less friendly and less of a host to these actors. Spain needs to assert that housing is a human right. And so if you're engaged in housing, the rules are different than any other business that's not a human right. Fine, if you're in a different business that's not a human right, You do what you want. But when you're in the business of human rights, in the area of human rights, then you have to adhere to hum a human rights framework. And so then Spain would have to create a new culture, mm -hmm. a new, the party, if they're hosting a party, the party would be different. Yep. And it would be one that is hostile. They would, Spain would have to create an environment that is not friendly. And that's things like, and I don't know because of the translation whether Raquel already said this. So my apologies, Raquel, if I'm only repeating, but things like you, a, a prohibition on vulture funds owning banks in Spain or parts of banks in Spain. Uh -huh. A prohibition on, on golden visas where the incentive is residential real estate. Just don't allow it. Um, Airbnb is part of your financialized market. 
And it yep. can't just be up to one city here and one city there to curb Airbnb, a national policy and law that controls Airbnb, um, but also a complete examination of the tax system and the ways in which the tax system allows for speculation. These actors get incredibly well treated where tax is concerned. They get preference, they get special tax treatment. They're often not paying corporate tax at all. So that would have to change. So, it, and then add to that very strong tenant protections because these mm -hmm. landlords, landlords, these financial actors don't like tenant protections. They don't like mm -hmm. five-year leases. They don't like rent freezes. And we're seeing this in Berlin. We're seeing this in Denmark, where those governments have tried to impose those sorts of tenant protections. And suddenly, the financial actors are very angry, very putting up a big fight. Then we know we're winning. When they start reacting. We are doing the right thing. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I was just about to ask you about any examples. Maybe uh, we can we can learn from them. Uh, who are being hostile to these volunteer funds um, uh, that you can tell us and, and look forward? Is Berlin, because we always speak about Berlin, but is there any other countries or cities around the world that they are trying some, mm. some movements for this? Mm. I mean, Denmark has, and, and we can critique, let's be clear, we can okay. critique Denmark for some very bad housing policies, uh, and some very bad policies around migrants and refugees. But, mm -hmm. but with respect to financialization, they have tried, they have a law in Denmark, they call it the Blackstone Lex or Blackstone Law. And they call it that because it was created because Blackstone was threatening housing and buying up entire neighborhoods in Denmark and Copenhagen in particular. So they enacted a law, for example, that um, says, okay, Blackstone, yes, you can come in or, or uh, vult other vulture funds, private equity, mm -hmm. you can come in, you can purchase buildings, but if you renovate, And if you try to, you cannot raise the rent for five years. They originally wanted mm -hmm. seven, but, but they only mm -hmm. got five through the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Immediately, immediately they saw a decrease in the amount of purchasing that's happening. That's a, it, it's not a huge, that's not a huge um, structural change, but it was something. They also mm -hmm. um, uh, enacted... Um, some laws to make things more transparent. And these funds don't like transparency generally. They don't like to be, to show that we call it beneficial ownership, who is actually owning the properties. So in Denmark, they're encouraging more transparency, which, which these actors don't like. That's one example. I'll give one more and then I'll let Raquel in. I just want to say in Canada right now, we're in the middle of a, a, a general election. Uh, so uh -huh. it's on Monday next week and all of the political parties, it's, it's, it's a complete change. All of the political parties have included measures that they think will push back against these big actors that we have in my country as well. So they're looking at things like, and I'm not, I won't evaluate them. It will take too long. But they're looking at things like a, a tax on vacant homes. Okay, I'm going to comment on that. That's not strong enough to me because then the mm -hmm. homes are still vacant. So mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. should be expropriating or thinking more along the lines of this, I think more radical. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're looking at that. They're looking at ceasing. One party says no investment no investment in, in residential real estate from these big actors for two years, a complete freeze. So there's movement. Um, and if you look at the, what the political parties in Canada are asking for, these are some of the things. Um, I, I leave it, you know, there, there, there's some more, but I want Raquel to weigh in as well. Okay. Eh, sí, creo que además 
Bueno, creo que la agenda de la discusión, no solamente de la idea de control de los alquileres, regulaciones de alquileres, sino de intervención en este mercado de vivienda, después que yo diría que un consenso universal, ¿no? que es la idea neoliberal de que el Estado debería salir del tema de vivienda y déjalo en los mercados, que los mercados, los mercados van a cuidar de estar equitativos y por todas las razones que hemos presentado aquí, el efecto ha sido una situación de emergencia de vivienda como ya no se veía hace mucho, ¿no? Entonces, la discusión sobre las alternativas están sobre la mesa. Creo que lo que pasó durante la pandemia puede ser, un, a pesar de ser transitorio, no suficiente y mucho más que podemos decirlo sobre esto, es, un, es muy interesante para intentarnos imaginar futuros posibles en términos de vida. Uh -huh. Por la primera vez en muchos países, en Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, se habló de eh, parar totalmente con los desalojos. Se habló de controlar el precio de alquiler, de congelar precios de alquiler por un tiempo, por la crisis sanitaria, por la pandemia, ok. Pero los tabús que teníamos, ¿no? que era la idea de que sí, sí se puede, sí debe intervenir sobre los mercados residenciales. Durante la pandemia, porque es una cuestión de defensa de la vida, pero calieran. Y durante un periodo, hemos, en varios países del mundo, en varios países, en, en Europa, en, 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 en América del Norte, pero también en América del Sur, en África, en Asia, se han adoptado medidas provisorias. Y estas medidas provisorias nos enseñan un camino que yo creo que puede ser un camino a seguir. Pero también hay que pensar, y ahí hablamos de Dinamarca, hablamos de Berlín, hab hablamos, hablemos de experiencias históricas de control de alquileres en Estados Unidos, en Nueva York, en San Francisco. Es, es una experiencia histórica y, y, y estamos hablando de, de Nueva York, estamos hablando de la capital del capital, no estamos hablando de un país comunista que controla cosas, estamos hablando que funcionó durante décadas, ¿no? Políticas uh -huh. de control, que no es congelamiento de alquileres, sino de el establecimiento de un criterio, un criterio para que los alquileres puedan subir, que no sea simplemente su precio en el mercado global de commodities, ¿no? Esto, uh -huh. esto es es la cuestión. ¿Alguna relación con la inflación? ¿Alguna relación con los otros precios en el país? ¿Alguna relación con los, con los salarios de la gente? ¿Cuánto suben o no? Con la economía general y no una cosa totalmente discolada. Pero también eh, Leilani señaló aquí una política sobre los pisos vacíos, los inmuebles vacíos y su destinación. Creo que otra cosa muy importante que hemos aprendido durante la pandemia fue la iniciativa de algunas ciudades y eh, de algunos gobiernos de movilizar pisos vacíos, movilizar hoteles vacíos, movilizar espacio vacío para permitir acceso a la gente. ¿Por qué no? aprender desde estas lecciones, aprender de esta, desde estas experiencias para poder imaginar políticas más permanentes. Por ejemplo, movilizando propiedad pública vacía, no para partnerships con grandes fondos de inversión en su hambre de activos, sino para parcerías con cooperativas, con asociaciones que sean capaces de producir vivienda asequible. Mm -hmm. it, it is very interesting that you speak about the, the states because correct me if I'm wrong, but the moratorium in the states were were uh, about the sanitary reasons, not not understanding the housing as a human right. Is that right? 
So it, it was, you know, extended and everything because of the sanitary reasons of, of the pandemic. Yeah, but anyway, uh, sí, mm -hmm. fue, fue utilizada la moratoria por razones de pandémicas, nunca por razones del derecho a la vivienda, pero lo que estoy propongo, estoy propongo acá es, bueno, si fue posible vivir una moratoria en Estados Unidos, en la ciudad, durante la pandemia, ¿por qué no uh -huh. es posible pensarla desde un punto de vista del derecho a la vivienda y desde, desde el derecho a la ciudad? Okay. Okay. Let's uh, speak. Uh, let's talk about the public rental and housing stock. If you, if you want to, what would uh, a public-private partnership? You, you said something, Raquel, about cooperativas. Maybe. Um, what would a public-private partnership look like for the creation of public housing stock in order to avoid another housing bubble? Is it public rental housing the only alternative to home ownership? What does your ideal housing model look like? Leilani, maybe you can start. No, I don't have an ideal uh, housing model. <laughs> it's not for me to decide an ideal housing <laughs> model. It's for people to decide. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's what I love about human rights is it provides standards and norms, but it, it does not dictate and it is not top down. It has to be bottom up. So, but yeah. there are some very interesting and, and Raquel, actually, in one of her reports, she details a lot of different ways that in, I think it was your security of tenure report, Raquel, the different ways in which ownership and housing can, can form. So she's better placed than me, but one of the things I've seen in the United States that's kind of, there's a great, small thing that's interesting is a movement to allow tenants or mm -hmm. renters to buy the buildings that they're living in when they go up for sale. And there's one, I think it's in Washington, D.C., where they have such legislation that it's required that the tenants be given what we call the right of first refusal. So mm -hmm. okay. if they can manage to purchase the building, then they can purchase it. So then it becomes this co-ownership model. It's very, it's very interesting. And for the United States, it's quite unusual. Um, mm -hmm. California, they have a law that's problematic, but there's something there where if a house goes for a home, a house goes, not a, not an apartment building, an individual house mm -hmm. goes for sale. Um, the, the, the person living in the house, if they're renting it can try to purchase it. So, but, but first what has to happen is it goes to auction. So let's say private equity Blackstone says, I, we want that house and we're going to pay 600,000 for it. The mm -hmm. person living there can match that and purchase it themselves. But this is, as Raquel would rightly say, problematic because which tenant living in a house can match- Has that the amount of power. money. Mm. Yeah, but mm. the, the I, you have to take these things for the- for the idea, and then you can massage it and make it actually better and for it to work. But I like these ideas. One of the things I've been trying to advocate in the North American context is the idea that if an apartment building is going for sale, because in, in Canada and the US, Blackstone is buying many, many, apart and other actors, many apartment buildings. Shouldn't the residents, the tenants have a say as to who's buying, what the conditions of sale are? Mm -hmm. Isn't there a way that we can get, make it so that tenants are actually engaged? That's a human rights principle, right? Because the mm -hmm. sale of a property has a direct impact on the tenants who are living there. If it's sold to a private equity firm, they will raise the rents, people will be evicted. So the tenants should have that's the right to participate with. It is considered a human right. Um, so I, I mean, these are just, I'm just throwing out, you know, ideas. There's many, many other, I mean, there's cooperative housing. Raquel can talk about many, many ideas that, uh, that she's already mm -hmm. written about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the, the most important message here is there is no model. 
There is no <laughs> single model. So and, I made a very wrong question then. <laughs> well, no, the, the question is because the need and the possibility yeah. of the different groups are very different. A very different. Mm -hmm. The options mm -hmm. of housing, housing options that should be available. Ah, estoy hablando en inglés. <laughs> las, <laughs> las, 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 las alternativas, eh, por ejemplo, de vivienda, de política de vivienda para, eh, para las personas que están viviendo en las calles, deben ser necesariamente distintas de alternativas de vivienda para otras situaciones. Porque la alternativa de vivienda para la gente que está en las calles que es, es vivienda primero, definitivamente, pero es vivienda que también tiene que ser acoplada con otras políticas sociales, con otras políticas para que, para que sea posible una vida digna a partir de la vivienda. Yo diría que eh, hemos pasado por un periodo donde el modelo único era vivienda en propiedad, adquirida mm. Por, un, mm. por una hipoteca, por un crédito financiero, bueno, resultado, endeudamiento, pierda de la vivienda y todo esto que ya lo sabemos y ustedes han vivido mucho, mucho intensamente. Entonces, mm. después de eso, ahora hay la idea del alquiler corporativo, pero siempre basado en cómo el capital puede extraer rendimientos desde la vivienda y no basado en cuáles son las necesidades. Yo diría, vivienda pública es una posibilidad, la única posibilidad, no, cooperativas. Hay un movimiento importante de vivienda cooperativa en España, en el mundo, importante porque la vivienda cooperativa protege la gente contra los ataques especulativos del mercado. Pero es verdad que no es toda la gente que está dispuesta a vivir y organizarse en cooperativa. Es una parte de la, de la gente que sí. Entonces, esto tiene que ser apoyado, pero también no puede ser el único modelo disponible. El alquiler, un alquiler protegido, también puede ser una solución uh -huh. interesante. Un alquiler público, protegido públicamente, también puede ser una solución. Creo que los, los, eh, las, eh, todas las, las políticas de suelo que pueden disponibilizar suelo para la vivienda también pueden ser importantes. Creo que lo más importante es partir de las necesidades de la gente y a partir de las necesidades de la gente poder eh, dibujar una política de vivienda eh, que les encuentre y no desde arriba, ¿no? en diálogo con la industria de la construcción civil mm. y la industria financiera, bajar un modelo uh, de vivienda único que es más o menos la tradición que tenemos ¿no? de política de vivienda en todo el mundo, no solamente en uh -huh. España. Ok, ok, we are shortly, uh, you wanted to add something, Leilani? No, only to, ah, to say, you. just to say, I love this last point of Raquel's. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the idea of um, starting from people's needs. It's also starting from people's incomes. We have, there, there's a complete break between household income, what people can afford to pay, and what mm -hmm. is being charged. We have to go back to a model where housing cost is related to household income, period. So if mm -hmm. you have 100 euros a month to live on, then your rent should not be more than 30 euros a month, you know? Like back to the basics on, on household income because it's everywhere in every city in the world, housing is completely mm -hmm. unaffordable. Okay, so I think we have a lot of uh, Q&A questions, but if we can use only 30 seconds, because I don't want to leave this behind, to ask you about what should, just in case the Spanish government is listening <laughs> today, uh, what should the Spanish government do with the SAREF? I mean, the bad bank, Raquel, Leilani, what should they do with that? 
Perdón, ¿me puedes preguntar de nuevo? What should they do with the SARE, the, the, the bad bank holding properties from rescued banks? The Spanish government should do something just in case that they are... Yeah. They no, are, the, es, es muy importante esta cuestión porque es una oportunidad de oro de poder poner este stock ¿no? residencial vacío en las manos de quienes lo necesitan. Es una oportunidad increíble. Este es el verdadero bailout que necesitamos, ¿no? Un bailout que toma, no, no, no dar, dar más, más plata a quien nos robó y acumuló más plata, sino eh, a esta, este stock que fue el resultado de toda, de toda la falencia de la política, poder ser movilizado para poder es ofrecer una alternativa a aquellos y aquellas que hoy están sin techo, sin posibilidad de vivir o que están pagando en alquiler eh, y no teniendo, eh, no teniendo plata para alimentarse porque están uh -huh. gastando todo lo que ganan con alquileres. Entonces, creo que esto es, es una oportunidad y esto es, depende, a mi juicio, exclusivamente de una decisión y de una política gubernamental, porque toda esta conversa de que Ay, no hay recursos, no tenemos, la cuestión no es no hay recursos o si hay recursos, la cuestión es cuál es la prioridad de inversión en los recursos públicos, en los bienes comunes que tenemos. Creo que esta es la pregunta central. Ok. Just to add and not to be um, too legal about it, but, um, you know, the standard that Spain has committed itself to is to uh, implement the right to adequate housing using the maximum of available resources. Governments always think that means only uh, budget through their budgets, mm -hmm. but this stock of housing that is sitting there is a resource and the government and as are all the vacant houses etc cetera, etc cetera. so the gov governments not just spain all governments have to start thinking quite differently about what it means to use the maximum of available resources it's a it's they have to start redefining what are available resources and i that mm -hmm. goes to raquel's very eloquent point Okay, then so let's go to the people's opinions and people's needs, if you want to. I think we need to change to Q&A, right? And uh, the queue from the PA will be uh, uploading the questions, I think. Uh, we should read the questions, I think. Yes, yes ma'am. Please read them. Okay, okay, okay. So the first one is from Movimiento Nadie Sin Hogar, right? Yes. Okay, so I, I wait here. From uh, the movement, nobody without a home of homeless people, we believe that housing policies and the future law on the right to housing must inev inevitably sorry, include a housing first approach that guarantees the protection of a roof over the heads of homeless people. So as to eradicate as a priority, the situation that puts at risk the health and lives of people who have become homeless, as well as violating other fundamental rights, such as the right to privacy or the right to physical and moral integrity. Could you give us an assessment of this approach and whether you as UN housing reporters or former <laughs> consider that it should be included in the future housing rights law and in the housing programs that will implement it? Okay. Yeah, I can. Do you want me to go first? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, please. Uh, so, of course, homelessness is a violation of the right to housing, and it has to be addressed by governments on an urgent basis and priority basis, because it's a what we say prima facie violation. Um, as Raquel and I have said, human rights doesn't dictate one approach to addressing homelessness or any other housing issue. 
Um, so, you know, it, it, if the movements in Spain think that the housing first approach is the correct approach and the one that will work best there, then of course it should be, it should be part of your policy and, and potentially your law. Um, the, the housing first approach um, uh, has to, however, um, include um, addressing the structural causes of homelessness. Because you, if you have a population, however many, that are homeless, living in homelessness, and you use the housing first approach, it means you're, you're making sure they each have access to a home and the social supports and services they need for a dignified life. But that doesn't stop new homelessness from being created. And so uh -huh. it's very, housing first alone will never solve homelessness. The homelessness that's being created in Spain is very structural. There are systemic reasons for homelessness. So those have to be addressed as well uh, and uh, alongside. So if you look at Finland that uses a successfully housing first, what at first they were only doing housing first, then they realized, ah, we're not really solving homelessness. Uh -huh. Then they turn to say, okay, what are the structural causes of homelessness? And they realized, for example, their welfare system was not sufficient. People were receiving such a small amount of money and they couldn't pay their rent if there was an emergency or a crisis and they were being evicted into homelessness. Or if there's no law that prevents eviction into homelessness, for example, um, you, you know, you need that in your law, which I think it is in the in the draft law. Um, that's a very important. That's a human rights standard. No eviction into homelessness. That is a gross violation of the right to housing. So so yes to housing first, maybe if that's what the movements want and think is useful, but it has to be with structural change as well. Mm -hmm. Raquel? Uh, sí, yo mencioné ya esta cuestión ¿no? de, las, de las personas sin techo y creo que cualquier, eh, cualquier ley de vivienda tiene que tener un apartado sobre este tema. Es una, es una cuestión de vivienda, pero es también una cuestión particular dentro de la cuestión de vivienda. Y creo que es muy importante tener ahí también eh, propuestas e intervenciones y como lo señaló, eh, Leilani, hay, hay ya algunas experiencias interesantes en distintos países con respecto a políticas para, este, para esta población. Ok, and uh, the next question is from Delia. Uh, y, would it be possible here in Spain to have a cooperative granting? Maybe you want yo, to directly, Raquel. Yo, yo diría que Todo es posible, todo es posible Absolutely. una vez que ya dejamos la idea de que tenemos que tener un modelo único y que vivienda en propiedad es la única solución. O sea, ahí se abre todo un abanico de, de soluciones y de posibilidades. Y es un, una cuestión, eh, yo creo, de la imaginación ¿no? de la gente y de los gobiernos de empezar a a enfrentar este tema y no, y esto es de nuevo, creo que es muy importante, no solamente en términos de pensar producción de vivienda para esto, para aquello, para la nada, eh, en modalidad de propiedad o en modalidad de alquiler, sino también muy importante pensar, y esto creo que es, que es eh, eh, parte de la ley de vivienda que ustedes están discutiendo y proponiendo, intervenciones en temas como desalojo, como rentas, control de alquiler y, y, y mucho más. Uh -huh. I don't know if Leilani wants to add something. Or should we go to the next question? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I won't add anything. It's better to have some more questions, I think. Okay, well, I think it's Carmen, right? Carmen Alcalazo from the Sindicato de US. The next one, go ahead, Carmen. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thanks so much, Raquel, Leilani, and Merche. I think, and the power, of course, I 
I think this is this ha this has been great. Uh, I'm gonna switch to Spanish for my question so everyone understands. Uh, so basically, in the uh, in los últimos cinco años, los alquileres han aumentado 30 veces más que los sueldos en España, ¿no? Desde 2013, el precio medio del alquiler ha subido más de un 50%, obligando a muchísimas familias a dedicar más de la mitad de sus ingresos a pagar el alquiler. Bueno, tal como advertían los expertos de la ONU, es recomendable que la población no destine en ningún caso más de un 30% de sus ingresos a gastos deriva derivados del hogar, ¿no? como el alquiler y los suministros energéticos. Bueno, la situación ahora mismo es completamente insostenible. Actualmente, 7 de cada 10 desahucios son por impago de alquiler. ¿no? La realidad es que el acceso a la vivienda de la población depende de la relación entre los ingresos de las familias y los precios del mercado, eh, dado que existe una enorme escasez de oferta pública. Entonces, a pesar de que hace falta aumentar el, el, el parque de vivienda protegida, pasarán muchísimos años eh, antes que podamos alcanzar este objetivo. Así que eh, desde el sindicato de Yugateras, que no me he presentado, pero soy Karma Algarazo en representación al, al sindicato de Yugateras, de Tenants Union de Barcelona en este caso, eh, pensamos que es imprescindible eh, contener los precios del alquiler para reducir el sobreesfuerzo de la población para acceder y mantenerse en la vivienda. ¿no? Este problema, además, no solo afecta a quienes viven de alquiler o quieren acceder a una vivienda, sino al conjunto de la sociedad. O sea, los precios actuales están disminuyendo drásticamente la renta disponible en manos de la ciudadanía eh, que tiene un impacto en toda la, la economía eh, de nuestras ciudades. Entonces, hace justo un año, la semana que viene va a ser un año, de hecho, el Parlamento de Cataluña aprobó por mayoría absoluta la Ley de Medidas Urgentes en materia de contención de rentas en los contratos de arrendamientos de vivienda en Cataluña, ¿no? una ley de contención de rentas. Esta ley, que fue impulsada por el Sindicato de Yucateras y por miles de organizaciones sociales, económicas, culturales, regula y modera los precios de los alquileres en viviendas de uso residencial que estén en un área eh, declarado tenso. En estos momentos, pero pese a contar con pocas cifras públicas, podemos afirmar que la regulación de alquileres ya ha incentivado una bajada de hasta un 5% en los precios de los alquileres eh, de los municipios donde, donde se aplica y que al contrario... Eh, de lo que lo especulaban los grandes lobbies inmobiliarios, esta regulación no ha reducido la oferta, eh, sino que al revés, se han firmado más contratos que nunca. Entonces, ya voy a las preguntas. Eh, ¿Creéis que los mecanismos de control de precios del alquiler son efectivos para democratizar el, efecto, el, el acceso a la vivienda? Después, ¿qué características, características consideréis que son claves para, para que sean efectivos esos controles del alquiler? Um, cre ¿Creéis que la ley de contención de precios catalana es una medida adecuada para servir de ejemplo a otros territorios que también tengan eh, problemas con el precio del alquiler en el, en el resto del Estado? Y, por último, eh, ya, ya paro, si consideráis necesario que el gobierno implemente los mecanismos necesarios para mantener esta medida en Cataluña, o sea, para que en Cataluña se puedan seguir regulando los precios, y también extenderla al resto de los, de, de los territorios del Estado. Y muchas gracias una vez más a todas. Bueno, gracias Carmen. Yo, yo empiezo eh, mientras Leilani se organiza y con la traducción. Eh, creo que sí, que la respuesta es absolutamente sí, que es absolutamente necesario regulación de alquileres. No conozco específicamente los mecanismos adoptados por la nueva ley en Cataluña, pero ya en principio como concepto sí es absolutamente necesario. Y, y hemos señalado esto varias veces acá a, a lo largo de nuestra conversación. Esto es necesario, urgente, general, global. ¿Por qué? 
porque el alquiler se ha convertido en la nueva ola de la financiarización de la vivienda. Es financiarización de la vivienda 2.0. Esto es alquiler. Entonces, ahí tenemos que poner toda, toda, toda la atención. También quiero señalar críticamente políticas que intentan eh, tratar este tema del, te, del impacto del alquiler en la renta y condiciones de vida eh, de la gente con políticas de vouchers, o sea, políticas de ayudar a la gente con plata pública, con presupuesto público, a que paguen alquiler. Esto es la peor de las alternativas que podamos tener. Es lo peor, es todo, todos los que, los, los que están involucrados en la financiarización de la vivienda desean es pasar plata pública, privatizarla a los bolsillos de los grandes propietarios, de los pequeños propietarios también. Y no es esta la intención, creo que es una política muy perversa y cuando empezamos a hablar de esto es muy necesario ya interrumpir la conversación. Esta no es una política adecuada para protección del alquiler, a pesar de que está muy vigente y muy promovida estos días por incluso organismos internacionales y etcétera. Exactamente por su poder de trasladar recursos públicos, plata pública a bolsillos de los grandes inversionistas. Hmm. Interesting. I think Raquel is talking about what we call in some context like rent supplement, but I'm not sure. So, yeah, vouchers, yeah. rental yeah. vouchers. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. so I've seen mixed mixed results with rent supplements. I understand well the argument that it puts it just simply puts money in the pocket of landlords. Where I've seen it work well is when someone's income, someone has income, but it's just a bit too low for the, for the rental and they need the supplement or they will be evicted. <laughs> they need it to pay the rent. We call it, it's more like a rent bank. So they can get, a, it's not a loan. They get money from the state to pay the difference between what, what they have and what they owe. And, and so it's a, it's a version of a rent supplement that's, that can, can be very effective to prevent evictions. So it's like, a, we call it a rent bank, uh, just to say. Um, I wanted to say on rent control, one of mm -hmm. the arguments um, against rent control is often, oh, if you put rent control, then the landlord lets the building go down and won't invest in the building and well i think then it's for governments to ensure that doesn't happen and that that's the role of government to regulate and to make sure that standards are met we would never find it acceptable for a landlord to say in chile for example an earthquake zone oh you know what you know, I'm not the, the tenants, it's, it's too expensive for me to make sure my building is maintained to protect against the earthquakes. It, government in Chile would never allow that. No way, because it's so important to protect. They know, they know the effect of the earthquakes. So similarly, governments can say, you have to provide a dignified place for people to live. And, and you will have to understand that some of your profits will go toward maintaining the building, even with rent control in place. And, and if you don't like it, don't be in the business of housing, because housing is a human right. I mean, this is what I mean about governments need to start asserting, put themselves back in the equation. The, it is their role, it is their obligation to tell the private actors what they have to do so the government can meet their human rights obligations. Otherwise, the private landlord is violating the government's obligations to implement the human right to housing. And so, But that discussion is never happening. Ne there's no government pushing the privates to say, 
if if you engage in housing, you have to meet my obligations as government on, on the human right to housing. You don't hear that, but that's the conversation that should happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go to, with uh, Santi from the Plataforma Afectados now. Santi, go ahead. Hello, Hello. everyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm Santi from, from, from PA. Uh, hi, Leilani. Hi, Raquel. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you for your time and support to our law. It, truly, it's, it's truly an inspiration listening to you, but hopefully your support will also mean a lot to the Spanish government and that will make uh, 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 a sustainable change on their position, on their actual position. I'm going to switch also to Spanish so everyone can understand and Leilani, I think you can read on, on the chat the, the question. Uh, hace 43 años, los españoles aprobamos nuestra primera Constitución, eh, donde en su artículo 47 ya recoge el derecho a disfrutar de una vivienda digna y adecuada, estableciendo además que los poderes públicos promoverán las condiciones necesarias y establecerán las normas pertinentes para hacer efectivo este derecho, así como también regularán el uso del suelo para, para pedir, eh, impedir su especulación. Todo esto está en nuestra Constitución, pero 43 años después, ningún gobierno, sea cual sea su color político, se ha atrevido a legislar para garantizar este derecho y que se cumpla con la, con la Constitución. Ninguno, además en un artículo que consideramos tan importante como es para garantizar el derecho básico de todo ser humano, el derecho a poder acceder a una vivienda digna y adecuada. Nada más. Simplemente un lugar donde vivir con dignidad y donde tendremos una un lugar de, sin eso, no tendremos una salud adecuada y tampoco tendremos una educación adecuada para poder decidir sobre nuestro futuro. La vivienda se basa, es la base donde se construye todo lo demás. Hace más de una década sufrimos graves daños en la economía del país y en la vida de las personas a raíz de la decisión de un gobierno que apostó como gran motor de crecimiento por el sector financiero e inmobiliario. Primero fue el tsunami urbanizador, que se hizo a costa del endeudamiento de por vida de las familias, un aumento de la oferta que no consiguió bajar el precio de la vivienda, sino todo lo contrario, desmontando el mantra de los, de los neoliberalistas que dicen que a más oferta bajan los precios. La ley de la oferta y la demanda simplemente no se aplica a un bien de primera necesidad como son eh, la vivienda, ya que no lo podemos sustituir y le dedicaremos el máximo de nuestra renta disponible. Luego vino el estallido de la burbuja y los desahucios de miles de familias. Al mismo tiempo que el Estado rescataba con más de 60.000 millones de nuestros impuestos a la banca a la banca, nosotras se nos desahuciaba y nuestras viviendas eran vendidas a fondos buitres radicadas en paraísos fiscales para, por una ínfima parte de lo que nos costaba a nosotros. Más de un millón de desahucios sin, altera, sin alternativa habitacional han tenido lugar desde el 2008, al que nuestro raquítico parte, parque público del 2% no ha podido dar respuesta. Todo esto con la cooperación y con la por acción y por omisión del Estado español. Desde la sociedad civil hemos luchado mucho para defender la vivienda como un derecho y no como un bien de mercado. Y ahora estamos viviendo un momento crucial en la que la sociedad organizada, ante la parálisis del gobierno, propone al Estado una ley. Una iniciativa de ley que, a diferencia de las que parece ser que está trabajando el gobierno, autoproclamado más progresista de la democracia, la nuestra impone obligaciones y no solo incentivos fiscales o, o cheques a las grandes propietarios de este país. Lo que pasa en España, como también habéis comentado anteriormente, eh, respecto al derecho a la vivienda, puede ser un referente a nivel internacional. En todo momento entendemos que como ciudadanía nosotros nos hemos de preguntar cómo afrontamos todo esto y forzamos al Estado a cumplir la Constitución y los acuerdos internacionales que han firmado y que garantizan el derecho a la vivienda. Eh, nuestra ley, a semejanza de la ley catalana, la 24-2015, obliga a los grandes propietarios, que son personas físicas o jurídicas de más de 10 pis, de 10 eh, apartamentos, a hacer un alquiler social a las personas vulnerables. Y va relacionado con la pregunta o la conversación que teníamos antes, ¿no? Nosotras consideramos que hay que obligar también al gran propietario a hacer un alquiler social a, a las familias vulnerables que no pueden pagar su alquiler. En vez de dar cheques, en vez de dar eh, otras alternativas, es forzar al privado a que asuma parte de su responsabilidad. Entonces, la pregunta concreta para la relatora sería ¿qué límites y responsabilidades se puede exigir al gobierno que imponga los fondos buitres y otros agentes financieros? Y nuevamente, muchísimas gracias por, por vuestro tiempo. Apologies, there was a problem with the chat. I will very quickly translate this question while you gather your thoughts. Sorry, Leilani, don't panic. Yes, uh, and, the chat and I have, right. unfortunately, I had only till 3.30, so I'm running okay. really late. I have something else to get to, so. Me too, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a nutshell, what was the question? I will just um, ask the question. It was, uh, 
at all yes. times of citizens, we've uh, asked ourselves, wait, what limits and responsibilities can the state be required to impose on vulture funds and other financial agents? Um, and what kind of compulsory requirements can there be on social rent? Sí, creo que es, es una cuestión no solamente para los fondos buitre, porque mira, fondos que no son buitre también tienen que ser regulados e impedidos de entrar. Por ejemplo, Airbnb es, es una, un, una plataforma de inversión, no es buitre, pero, pero tiene un impacto muy grande en los mercados residenciales y es, un, y es una obligación de los gobiernos una obligación ante el marco internacional de los derechos humanos garantizar que la acción de eh, agentes financieros no provoque lo que se está provocando, la falta de acceso a la vivienda adecuada a la gente. Esto es bastante claro y los instrumentos ahí están para esto. No sé si Leilani... You want to add I'm not something? sure I understand uh, the question, but um, I mean, but the, if the, yeah, the question Sandy, was, yeah. if we can force governments to, how can we force governments to implement mm -hmm. and to force them, uh, force them to, uh, for them to be obliged to offer social rent to to vulnerable families? If you think that this, yeah. uh, this could be a policy yeah. that could work in ah. order to prevent uh, evictions. Ah. Uh, the social rents would be provided by the government, not by the privates, or no, it would be imposed private. on the privates. Okay, uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, I mean, in Germany, what they've what the Berliners decided was to take a different approach, which was to expropriate from the privates to turn into social mm -hmm. rents. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an interesting idea. It's something that uh, is being talked about here in Canada. Um, because the the big financial actors here are very concerned that the activists and advocates are going to win social policy and tax policy, and then they won't be able to operate. So they have started, the, the, the financial actors themselves have started to say, what if we started to provide affordable rents? Mm -hmm. So some we buy a building, we, we keep some market, And we keep some, we make some affordable. They don't say social, but affordable. It's risky to me because it's always at the end of the day about accountability. And how do you hold them accountable? Now, if it is through some legal contractual arrangement, that's cool. But this is for the government to be involved in as well because it's the government that has the human rights obligations. And social rent is 100% an obligation of governments. They can't, mm -hmm. every society will need social rents. You, there is no place on the planet where social rents are not necessary, right? Because there are always low income people and people with no income who require social rents. And th this is in general comment for that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights said social rents will almost always be necessary. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Our positioning is not only the government has to provide them, also the private, because they are in the business yes. by human rights. So they are. Yeah, I, ag I agree with that. But the, the government has the power to ensure the privates do that. Correct. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And the privates would have to be accountable to the government to do that. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. I agree that the privates have to play a role. They can't just be mm -hmm. the problem, they have to be part of the solution, especially in Spain, where you have a completely privatized market right now it's only mm -hmm. reasonable that the privates actually contribute mm -hmm. yeah I, okay I so agree i think that. It, but it's accountability mm -hmm. how to how to keep them accountable yeah okay. okay so i think it's time to say goodbye because both of you have to to yes. leave so a, a quick thank you and big thank you for being with us i think it's very very important for all the movement the pa and the rest of the housing movement to feel your public support as a UN reporters. And uh, I have been personally, I have learned a lot personally, and thank you for your patience with my terrible English. Okay, so um, 
thanks for your uh, time and have a nice day there in the east, you know. <laughs> and I hope I meet you soon as a journalist or a, a, I don't really care, but I want to meet you both again. <laughs> Uh, and also, yeah. it was Gracias, a pleasure. To, it is a very pleasure to be here, and you. Uh, y es muy importante que todos sepan, y es creo que que es muy importante el trabajo y la lucha que ustedes están haciendo es importante y un referente para las luchas. Eh, en torno al derecho a la vivienda en el mundo. Creo que es muy importante también tener esta conciencia. Y muchas gracias por esta invitación y por estar acá con Leilani y con ustedes. Gracias. Vuestro muchas apoyo gracias. significa mucho y, no, y lo tendremos muy en cuenta. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Leilani. <laughs> Thank you. And I Thank just you want so to say, please yeah. let me know how I or the shift and I'm sure Raquel, maybe she said it, I didn't see a translation, but how we can continue to support you and help you as you move forward your law. You know, I'm always here. I'm always ready to try mm -hmm. something to help in any way. So please let me know. <laughs> Lovely. And okay. the initiative will make sure that uh, we, we, you get informed in each step of the mm -hmm. way. So uh, anytime that we feel that uh, you can help us, we will, as you have always done, both of you, so really appreciate and thank you. So yes, thank you, thank you again for your offer, and we will take on it, and and we will let you know. Okay. Thanks. Muchas okay. gracias. Chao, chao. So, bye. Muy, muy obrigado, gracias bro. a la plataforma. Gracias a la iniciativa. Me debéis unas cervezas bien grandes. <laughs> <laughs> gracias. Chao. Muchas gracias también a ese traductor. Gracias, Eric.